Well, good morning. It's uh, Acts chapter 10 and verses 1 to 23. And we left Simon Peter, if you remember at the end of last chapter, at Simon the Tanner's house in Joppa. Uh, We're given that little detail at the end of chapter 9. And maybe you've been thinking for a week, what is he doing there? Uh, Is it just a holiday by the sea and his mates uh, called Simon the Tanner and we need to know that it's Simon the Tanner because it's not Simon the Disciple. Two Simons in one place, all confusing, but it feels like you're given that information about Simon the Tanner being a Tanner because that's important. And it kind of is, isn't it? Why? Well, because if Simon is a tanner, then he's constantly dealing with the hides of animals and carcasses. He's dealing with dead things. And so he would be perpetually unclean. And here's Simon, um, the the Jew, who's now come to faith in Jesus. And yet he's, well, he's hanging out with someone who's perpetually unclean by the standard of the law. And that doesn't seem to bother Simon, it wouldn't seem. But actually, just back it up again, because... Peter so far has been doing some unusual things. Perhaps you remember back in verse 40 of chapter 9, he was there in the room with Tabitha who's dead. He's in a room with a corpse. Our corpse is unclean. What's he doing there? And previous to that in the chapter, in chapter 9 verse 34, he's with Aeneas, the paralytic man, the one who's unclean and couldn't access the temple himself. He seems okay with being around unclean things, it would seem at least. Well, now interesting in each of those occasions, uh, notice also what he says. In verse 40 with Tabitha, he tells her to get up. In verse 34, he tells the paralytic man to get up. And now later in this chapter, he's going to be told to get up and eat in chapter 10, verse 13. There's something going on with all this getting up. Um, In fact, we are, though, getting ahead of ourselves and we need to back up before we get up. So as we back up, we come to the beginning of this chapter and we're in Caesarea and with a a man named Cornelius, a man with a a, a Roman name uh, who actually is part of a Roman regiment. He's a centurion in what's known as the Italian regiment. And immediately we know a lot about this fellow. He's a Gentile, a pagan. But we also are told immediately that he's devout and that he's God-fearing. And that Cornelius, in verse 15 of this chapter, is going to be told to send for Simon Peter, who is at Simon the Tanner's house. And there we see Cornelius' response. He's obedient, and by verse 8 of this chapter, he dispatches uh, a set of envoys in order that Peter might be retrieved. At that point, we shift focus back to Peter in Joppa and he's on the roof. It's midday, he's praying and he's hungry. And in that state, he falls into a trance and sees a vision of a blanket being let down from heaven full of a whole bunch of different kinds of animals. All of the animals that in Leviticus chapter 11, he knows are unclean and not to be touched. And yet he's told to kill and eat. Uh, And now, Right then, something needs to be uh, restored. In the same way that Tabitha and Ananias are told to get up and restoration comes to them, Peter is told to get up and a kind of healing needs to take place in Peter. But it's a healing in his mind, a restoration of his thinking. So he is told to get up, to kill and to eat. And yet Peter's response is to say, surely not. I've never touched anything unclean. And then God's reply to him is to tell him not to call anything unclean that God has declared clean. Now, that is a radical shift for Peter to get his head around. And so in verse 16, he refuses. In fact, three times he says no. Now, that sounds very familiar, doesn't it? Peter's very good at denouncing things three times. He's done the very same thing when he's accused of being a follower of Jesus, remember. And here he's prepared three times to renounce what God is saying. This is clean. And he says, not so, not so. And then he's brought to a point of recognition. Now, at God's perfect timing, it would seem, all these things correlate. Do you notice in this chapter how everything fits together so neatly like a puzzle that's coming together? Because by verse 17, there's a knock down at the door and Peter, now loaded with this new information after his vision, he receives the Gentiles that are knocking at the door with some information. Now, by the time you get to verse 21, Peter asks the question that really should be on our mind in this chapter. Why have you come? Why have you come to get me? They reply in verse 22. 
We have come from Cornelius the centurion. He's a righteous and God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him to come to ask you to come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. So they have come because an angel has told Cornelius to get Peter to come and speak to him. But why couldn't the holy angel just tell Cornelius all that he needed to hear? He's a righteous and devout man. His requests have come up to God. Why doesn't God reveal to him like he's revealed on the day of Pentecost to all the apostles? Why must Peter go to Cornelius? I mean, that is the question that's being asked. Well, that's actually next week when we come to the next part of this chapter. But do you see what's going on here? God's providential hand in all of this. Because Peter, up until this point, has not been willing to take the gospel to a Gentile, as much as he's been ready to eat pork or camel or anything else. But see, what does God do? In preparation for Cornelius to hear the gospel, he prepares Peter in advance and he renews his mind because this will be the pivot point at which the gospel goes out to the nations. And Peter will be the one who will bear witness to that taking place. But hold that thought for next week. In fact, so important is this event that three times it's retold in the book of Acts. Remember when we began, we talked that actually that in the book of Acts, you see numbers of things repeating on themselves, um, the conversion of Saul, the repeating of the day of Pentecost. This event is another one of those repeat of three. So it happens in chapter 10 here, chapter 11, it's retold, and in chapter 15, it's told again. Why? Because it is a massive, big step for the Gentiles to receive the gospel. Because those that are unclean can now come to faith. It's, it's bigger than the unclean paralytic being healed. It's bigger than the unclean corpse being sat beside. That for Peter, the one who's steeped in the Jewish tradition, who understands that the God is the God of the Jews, now he realizes that he's going to be inviting people to worship and come to faith in Jesus from all nations. And we're going to see that played out in the next chapter from verse 23 to 48 and beyond. But for now, as we come to this, notice this is a chapter that tells you about the providential hand of God, that he's orchestrating all things for his good purposes, that God's heart is actually for all. And yet perhaps we think it's limited. Peter certainly does. And he needs to have God rebuke him to see that actually the gospel could come to Cornelius and to his family and to the whole world. But who for us, perhaps, do we think is like the Cornelius in our life? the one who is too far beyond the reach of God and the gospel. Well, there's no such person. Here is a word that tells you that the gospel is a message that everyone needs and is actually available to all. And with that thought, let's come to God in prayer. Lord God, we thank you for the start of this chapter where we see your hand at work, at work in the life of the man Cornelius and his family. Lord, in the life of Simon Peter as he sat upon the roof on that midday as you took the time to instruct him and guide him in your word and in your ways. Lord, I pray that where we have got our thinking of you wrong, that you would rebuke us and that you would encourage us. Lord, we thank you that you are a God who is for all nations. We thank you that you are the one who declares clean the unclean through the work of your son, Jesus. Lord, I pray for any place where we might think that there are those beyond the reach of your gospel. For this reminds us, Lord, that you love the world so much that you gave your one and only Son, that none would perish. And so, Heavenly Father, we pray that none would perish. And so, Lord, would you send us with the message of your gospel to those that you would seek to come to faith in you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.